Okay, we'll get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us here at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice's Emerging Scholars Lunch Talk. You know, I really regret that we can't all be gathered at CSSJ together uh, enjoying lunch, but nonetheless, I'm still happy to have the opportunity today to introduce uh, Justin Randolph, who will be giving a talk entitled Moonlight and Malicious, The Roots of Jim Crow Police Power in Rural America. Just a note, uh, today's event is being recorded and the format of the event is such that Justin will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, the Q&A will be through the Q&A function. Um, so please type in your questions and then uh, Justin, I'll ask them. Justin will have the opportunity to discuss them at greater length as well. So Justin Randolph is assistant professor of history at Texas State University, where he specializes in 19th and 20th century US social and political history. His primary research concerns the intersection of policing and inequality in the American South. He grew up in rural Alabama and received his PhD from Yale University in 2020. His first book, Mississippi Law, The Long Crisis of Policing and Reform in America's Black Countryside is under advanced contract with the University of North Carolina Press. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Justin. Thanks uh, so, uh, so much, Zach, and thanks for everyone for helping this come together. Anthony working the tech in the background, Kiku uh, for doing the other technical stuff, Catherine Van Amber for working with me as well, and Tony Bogues for the uh, invitation uh, way back when. It's great to be an emerging scholar, I guess. That's something that um, I'll hang on to. Just going to share my screen with you now. Sorry if it captured it. Feel free just to press escape to get me uh, back down to size. So I, I thought I'd start today with actually um, a place, Holly Springs in Marshall County, Mississippi. So Holly Springs is located on Chickasaw lands uh, that were ceded during the period of Indian removal with the Treaty of Pontotoc Creek in 1832. Thereafter, it went through a process of surveying and plotting uh, where little squares were etched onto um, uh, the landscape so that it could be subdivided and sold. The first land map was created in 1835 and the first land sold in 1836. Now, if you know anything about Holly Springs, you probably know about one of its most famous um, natives, Ida B. Wells, who was born in 1862 and died in 1931. She was a black freedom fighter. She was a black feminist, journalist and educator. Uh, Wells was born to James Madison Wells and Elizabeth Lizzie Warrington in, um, in Holly Springs, probably near this home, uh, a home uh, that was owned by her enslaver, a man named Spires Bowling, who was an architect and builder. Her father, uh, Jim, actually was a master carpenter who helped build homes like this across North Mississippi and especially in Holly Springs. Uh, someone you're probably less familiar with and have never heard of, frankly, is another person from Holly Springs, uh, immortalized here in his Confederate uh, Army uniform, uh, a man named Winfield Scott Featherston, who was born in 1820 um, and died in 1891. Um, this home that you see here was his, built in 1837. Uh, built by enslaved laborers. Um, Featherston actually married into it. Uh, it was his wife, Elizabeth Lizzie McEwen, um, who, uh, whose father owned this home and that he resided in for most of his professional life. So there is a deep connection through Holly Springs between these two historical figures, um, someone like Wells and Featherston. They're the two Lizzies, right? Um, uh, one's uh, place of residence was roughly 14 minutes uh, walking to the other. And in 1878, uh, Featherston actually lost his wife to a yellow fever uh, epidemic that struck the region and Wells lost her parents, both of her parents to yellow fever in the same epidemic, um, something that sent her um, to Memphis famously, uh, where she worked and wrote um, as well. But something else that connects them is uh, their views on the militia. They were both public uh, writers and thinkers, and both of them wrote on the militia, the um, this uh, state police power, paramilitary state police power um, that was um, uh, 
really important to the development of both of their sort of ideas of freedom at the time. A quote from Featherston here, written in 1890, when Mississippi is consolidating Jim Crow in its 1890 constitution, a constitution that will serve as a blueprint for white supremacist uh, racial order and rule throughout the South in the United States. Um, the circumstances by which we are now surrounded the great disparity in some localities between the two races which now occupy our territory, the occasional outbreaks between them which result in acts of violence and loss of life and the occasional resistance made by both races to the enforcement of the law through the courts of the country render it necessary to have a military force ready at all times to respond to the call of the state. This for Featherston was gonna be an all white militia. It was going to be a Jim Crow uh, force of state troops. Now, Wells also uh, wrote about the militia. Here she is in Southern Whores two years later, 1892. Women, the men and women in the South who disapprove of lynching and remain silent on the perpetuation of such outrages are equally guilty with the actual lawbreakers who would not persist if they did not know that neither the law nor militia would be employed against them. Here is Wells, of course, hopeful that there could be a paramilitary um, presence there that could um, stop lynching. And of course, for Wells, as I'll talk a little bit more about, she had in mind a black militia, the black militia of reconstruction um, on which she pinned her hopes for the end of lynching. So today, uh, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time outlining my larger book project that Zach was so kind to um, name, Mississippi Law, uh, and then I'll get into sort of the heart of the talk, which revolves around um, this militia, this state police power uh, that I'm going to argue to you has a very, uh, uh, very deep roots in the region. It's not just something that comes out of our modern era. So I'm going to think through uh, state police powers roots in settler militias and slave patrols in the antebellum period. And then I'm going to gesture towards this later period, especially we pausing for the consolidation of Jim Crow uh, in 1890. So my book, Mississippi Law, is really an exploration of paramilitary uh, state police reform. Uh, and I'm gonna take it hopefully from the birth of the Jim Crow racial order to the consolidation of mass incarceration after uh, the prisoners' rights movement of the 1970s. Uh, you know, what do I mean by paramilitary state power? It's centralized, it's professional, it's highly trained. Uh, it's going to be uh, modeled on military practice and um, materiel. In fact, many, uh, it will receive military surplus material um, to make it work. This will be the idea behind the state militia. And as that becomes uh, the state police, in fact. Now, when I say the state police, I don't mean just any old police. And here's a map of Mississippi's 82 counties as it now stands. Each of these counties has a sheriff. The sheriff has a number of deputies. Any town can have its own municipal police force. This is not what I'm talking about when I talk about the state police. I'm talking about in Mississippi, the Highway Safety Patrol, uh, an institution created in 1938 under the auspices of patrolling the highways, right? But it was going to be a centralized police force, something uh, owned and operated by the state, not something that was local or uh, beholden to um, local um, uh, control at all. And so this was a major tension, right? You'll have people who want there to be uh, a centralized state police power, and then you'll have local uh, sheriffs and deputies who are resisting this centralization. Uh, so it's right there in its very name, it's a patrol. Uh, you know, some people call it the state police, some people call it the highway patrol, you also hear them called state troopers. Uh, but the patrol, of course, is a holdover from larger, older ideas about patrols. Namely, I would tell you the slave patrol, right? It, it is a patrol in that older sense. Uh, and their nickname of state troopers actually revolve around um, what the state militia were called before um, the creation of the highway patrol, the state troops. So in the very name, right, you see this blending of state militia power, um, something that's older in a settler malicious mindset with ethnic cleansing really at the root 
and the slave patrol, this, uh, this power to contain black life in Mississippi's countryside. And this is a rural police force uh, first and foremost. So the book really breaks down into four different parts. Um, I'm trying to write about 11 short chapters to fall into each one. Section one, which we'll be hearing about more today is really about police power through reform, right? How the police grows and is institutionalized and becomes a mainstay of everyday life through reform, through the idea that police can be made better, that order can be better instilled through, um, through um, paramilitary police. Uh, then changing the land, I look at really how uh, the state police force is deployed in the agricultural transformations that take place in rural Mississippi. Uh, especially I'm looking at the transition from cotton to cattle. So from the labor intensive cotton economy that we think of synonymously with Mississippi, uh, but then the, the actual one of the largest uses of the land today, which is the beef cattle industry and how that uh, change actually necessitated a great deal of police power. Then I'll look at how the law was changed, right? I'm looking especially here at the direct action phase of the civil rights movement, because that is the grand sort of um, rationale for expanding uh, the state police force to trumping the powers of local sheriffs and local police officers, uh, that there is too much collusion between the police and uh, terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And at the same time, we have to suppress um, political uh, action that white supremacists would deem um, uh, irrational and unacceptable. And then last, I take us into the age of um, uh, mass incarceration with Magnolia Gulag, I'm calling it, right? The creation of this uh, prison uh, system that goes from just having a single state penitentiary parchment farm to a number of state prisons um, that dot the post-agricultural countryside. This is, as I said, a rural history, right? I'm looking at um, what I call the Black countryside, taking a phrase from George Padmore and trying to think about how in Mississippi, um, you know, life is actually um, structured by policing, especially this state police force, this centralized police force. I, I'm really trying to provide us a more systematic understanding of police violence. Certainly there's physical, psychological, sexual harm uh, meted out to individuals by the police. But it's also true that um, they're taking part in a wider social, ideological and political project that dispossesses black property owners, uh, that evacuates uh, black sharecroppers and tenants from the countryside. Uh, and that farmland I'm finding is coveted by white um, neighbors for wealth creation and they're using the police to do that. Uh, I'm taking my cues here actually from the records of the rural black activists who lived in Mississippi, uh, who fought policing along the way uh, across the long civil rights movement, uh, you know, stopping, pausing on black armed insurgents in 1906, the NAACP in 1947, SNCC in 1964, and incarcerated people in the 1970s. And if you do that, if you listen to the oral histories uh, left behind by folks who fought the police, you'll find uh, really peculiar uh, pieces of rural policing like this. Uh, this man, B. Cowart, was um, actually a member of the Livestock Theft Bureau of the Highway Safety Patrol, right? Something that we, we would never think of, but there was actually a cow police force that was created and wreaked havoc in black communities across the state and was resisted as such. Then there's a political movement. Uh, you see a state trooper here in the background uh, while the governor of Mississippi at the time or the lieutenant governor as it were, attempts to block James Meredith from desegregating the University of Mississippi in 1962. Uh, if you look photos from the movement, the state highway patrol is everywhere. Here one is in 1966 physically restraining Martin Luther King Jr. Fannie Lou Hamer, of course, uh, began her uh, public career in many ways around testifying to the abuse of 
uh, the Highway Safety Patrol, especially John Lutellus Basinger, um, the patrolman who abused and brutalized her in the Montgomery County Jail in the summer of 1963. This, of course, is a photo of Hamer testifying at the 1964 Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City, uh, a speech that Lyndon Johnson tried to stop from airing and that has become iconic since. And this is all leading up to, in the book, uh, a, a larger project of um, the Black Freedom Movement to critique policing like blatantly and to question deeply its roots and its futures. Um, a great uh, handbill here circulated by the movement, but this was also the work of movement leaders like Fannie Lee Cheney, the mother of James Earl Cheney, who was murdered um, in 1964 in the Freedom Summer Murders, what we think of as the Mississippi burning case. And so here we have a handbill uh, circular for uh, Fannie Lee Cheney actually speaking, and she had a speaking tour around the South and into the North uh, about the police um, violence and how it went hand in hand with the white economic political system um, in Mississippi. She famously uh, makes the comparison between the white landlord and the white jailer in one speech that I found. Um, the idea that you can't crack Mississippi, you can't understand uh, the social order there without necessarily understanding the connection between um, land and property ownership and uh, the carceral state. Uh, the Highway Patrol, though, really comes out on top of the civil rights movement. Um, two lawmen for you here on the left, Lawrence A. Rainey, the sheriff of Neshoba County, the county where James Earl Cheney, Mike Schwerner, and Mike Goodman uh, were um, captured, murdered, um, seen here as the archetypal sort of tobacco chewing, no good Southern lawman, alongside a picture of Maynard King, who was actually a state police inspector who aided the FBI in uh, uncovering what had happened in Neshoba County and cracking the case of uh, the Mississippi burning murders. Uh, in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, Mississippi will invest heavily in this centralized state police force, forever changing the, what it's like to even drive across the countryside, right? Will you get a ticket? Will you be uh, checked for a driver's license, right? The number of troopers triple between 1960 and 1970 alone, and they won't really uh, recede, uh, they haven't receded since. Uh, same with investment. The budget uh, has gone up uh, immensely over time. The 2022 budget is actually $240 million. Uh, since 2020 and the rise of COVID, Mississippi's Department of Public Safety has actually received $10 million just in CARES Act funding from the federal government amidst promises um, from the governor to, quote, refund the police as if it had ever uh, actively been defunded. But today I'm really going to drill down on the first part of my book, um, which consists of three chapters, um, really though seeking the roots um, of this centralized state police power, right? Because there's one way this story could begin in 1938 with the creation of a new state institution and a funding stream and, um, you know, a, a letterhead that gets sent around with, with, with mail. But that is not where these ideas come from. And that is not, in fact, where the people who found the Highway Patrol in 1938 come from. They are attached to much longer genealogy, uh, genealogies of um, yeah, humans, frankly, and of uh, thought. So that's what I'm going to get into now with our second section. Um, the roots of paramilitary state police power uh, really do come in the settler militia and slave patrols in Mississippi. Here, though, is a map uh, from Claudio Sant's Invasion of America project. It's an ArcGIS project where the gray um, 
denotes land seized by colonists uh, under force of arms at various points. Um, here, you know, I'm supplementing my thinking through the work of someone like John Grenier, whose first way of war argues that, you know, the first uh, war making in America was this irregular militia warfare. Um, Sant's own Unworthy Republic and Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's uh, work on militias as well in the synthetic vein, uh, I really think show us that militias um, in uh, this settler colonial uh, phase was the, were the front line of land seizure. Uh, and they often instigated conflict that led to occupation, dispossession, um, of land, and eventually this was dressed up through treaty, um, as we know. So the uh, Mississippi Territory was no different. Uh, it was founded or started, uh, chartered in uh, 1799. Um, thinking here of the work especially of Walter Johnson uh, on the uh, Mississippi Valley. But in 1799, Mississippi's territorial governor, a man named Winthrop Sargent, signed a law creating a permanent militia consisting of, quote, all free male inhabitants between the age of 16 and 50. It was one of the first orders of business. Uh, white settlers were to equip themselves with weapons and drill on the second Saturday of every month in anticipation of, quote, invasion or domestic disturbances actually existing or apprehended. Uh, of course, domestic disturbances here, your mind should jump straight to slave revolts as Carol Anderson has shown. Um, that was a motivating factor um, of government period, right? The promise that the state is there to suppress uh, the rebellion of enslaved people. Now, in 1822, this became even clearer. Lawmakers consolidated uh, the slave patrol law so that, quote, every owner of slaves and all other persons liable to perform militia duty were also liable to perform patrol duty. And, and the word patrol here is really, really important because never in this legislation did they use the word slave patrol. It is actually just understood that when they refer to the patrol, they mean uh, the slave patrol. Their jurisdiction and their charge was broad. They could uh, visit all Negro quarters, quote, or places suspected of sustaining unlawful assemblies of slaves or other disorderly persons unlawfully assembled. They could inflict corporal punishment up to 15 lashes to any enslaved person who was thought by them to be off um, uh, away without their um, enslavers permission. Um, so if you see here on the map, though, uh, in this earlier period, the Mississippi Territory is uh, split between largely Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Creek, uh, the land that will later become Alabama. And this is how Featherston really in enters the story. He comes to the old Southwest, um, as it would have been called, to build the Cotton Kingdom. Uh, he first, in fact, comes from his birthplace in Tennessee uh, down to Georgia, uh, what we might call West Georgia or East Alabama, to fight in uh, a settler militia before uh, going to uh, where we find him in Holly Springs. So this is from his own biographical notes in his papers at the University of Mississippi in 1836. While he was in high school in Columbus, Georgia, hostilities broke out between the Creeks and the Georgians. He joined a volunteer company and served as a soldier until the Indians were subdued. During this war, upon one occasion when it was especially dangerous to stand guard, the Indians having picked off several sentinels, the commander called for volunteers. Upon Featherston offering, he was assigned to their station. Uh, so here we see Featherston clearly banking on politicizing his role in Indian removal um, to further his career uh, far before he joins um, the, uh, the rebellion of slave owners in the 1860s. Um, he was a lawyer, you know, he was a politician, uh, Featherston was. Um, he was also a slaver himself. He enslaved 12 uh, people in 1860, but his business as a lawyer really connected him to the wider institution. There were 400,000 
uh, people enslaved in Mississippi in 1860. They accounted for 55% of the state's entire population. It was this slave society that Featherston uh, saw himself defending in, in 1861. Uh, it's defense uh, in the United States as they knew it as the time at the time, and also um, uh, its expansion. Right, we know that Confederates had dreams of extending uh, this uh, this slave empire into uh, Central and South America, and this was what he fought for. He was no idle subject in this either. He was actually uh, a secession um, commissioner. If any one of, of you have read the work of Charles Dew, you know that uh, after Mississippi secedes in January of 1861, they actually send a legation out uh, to uh, recruit other states to the cause. And Featherston uh, did that. He actually went and recruited states to the Confederate cause. So though after the war, this failed rebellion of slave owners that is put down by um, uh, a military occupation and a vast, um, what Du Bois famously called a general strike and what we can certainly say um, uh, was an uprising amongst enslaved people on the ground. Um, after this period of war, right, what does the militia mean? It had, it had only meant, uh, only uh, existed to be a, a force for um, uh, a settler genocide and um, uh, uh, the patrolling of enslaved populations, um, just as everything else was up in the air during Reconstruction. Um, the militia too came to be redefined in the period. Rebel states were under you know, something just short of complete occupation early on, and the U.S. Army could serve as a police force. So I, I take this little piece of um, public history work actually from Greg Downs and Scott Nesbitt, uh, their work mapping occupation, right? And if I'd shown you 1865, you would have seen a blanket of uh, U.S. Army occupation. Here by 1871, though, there's still major garrisons of, um, of U.S. Army troops, uh, and they are supporting the Black political project largely through the Republican Party, um, that also funds black militias, that arms black local militias in the period uh, that will do combat uh, with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, prominent works on this include that of Stephen Hahn and Carol Emberton, if you care to learn more. But Wells was, of course, um, also from a family that's intimately tied to this Reconstruction black politics. Um, yeah, she was born somewhere near this house in 1862 while Featherston was off fighting the war in Virginia. Um, Mia Bay reminds us that uh, Wells was a child of Reconstruction. Wells' parents were very careful to tell her stories uh, about life during slavery, stories that she actually uh, sent and retold to her own children. Uh, I think, and, May, and Bay agrees to, to stress the stakes and promise of an emancipatory black politics that had its moment in reconstruction. Paula Giddings in her own biography of Wells uh, shows that Wells family was involved in Republican politics in and around Holly Springs. Maybe the family even knew a man named George Washington Albright who was um, a, the leader of, uh, of a black militia unit there. He told the Daily Worker in 1937, quote, we drilled frequently um, and how the rich folks hated to see us armed and ready to defend ourselves and our elected government. Our militia helped fight off the Klan. So this presence, this very presence in the street of black uh, troops armed, right? This would have been something that Wells could have seen herself. Of course, though, uh, Featherston is on the other side of this. Um, he is, uh, in fact, uh, going to fight uh, and fight with uh, white supremacist lawmakers in the 1870s to overturn um, Reconstruction, to redeem state government, as they would have said at the time. In 1875, it's almost completed to voter intimidation, murder, and mob violence around polling places. 
this is a white supremacist strategy that becomes known, in fact, as the Mississippi Plan, something that is an innovation that will be adopted by white supremacist movements elsewhere in the South. But Featherston worried about this violent strategy. And this is something I want to stress to you. Um, he was all in for the overthrow of Reconstruction and the reassertion of white supremacy in politics, but he had grave concerns about the lawlessness, the disorder by which this uh, new white government had been attained. And instead, he really desired a paramilitary police presence to tamp it down now that it was in place. So if we look at him in 1877, um, he's giving speeches that shows for him what the future could look like. Our greatest and pressing wants in Mississippi at this time are more population and more capital. We want immigrants, laborers, planters, and artisans, men of families who come into the state by land and settle down for life and improve their places, thereby adding greatly to the wealth as well as to the productive laboring of the state. The impression prevailing abroad is that our people look with too much leniency upon those who violate the law and slay their fellow men, that ours is a land of bloodshed and violence. Our people have been greatly misrepresented and slandered. Such violations of law here as are of frequent occurrence in the oldest and best regulated states in the union are misrepresented, magnified, distorted, and made to appear as immense mobs of almost daily occurrence. His answer, of course, was the speedy enforcement of all laws for the prevention and suppression of crime, which will be the most effective means of drawing immigrants and capitalists to us. So here it is, right? It's, it's this desire for a standing military force at his, uh, at his command. Uh, this was to be, of course, um, you know, uh, an all white uh, militia force. This was to be uh, something to counter the bad press, the, to serve as sort of a public relations win uh, for their form of government that they're so um, uh, pained to install. Uh, and just to, to give some sense of how successful um, this campaign was by the 70s, right, we would be mistaken to think that it was, uh, that it had successfully chased Black Mississippians from the political sphere. We know, in fact, that neither the election violence of 1875 uh, the presidential election of 1876, famously uh, followed by a compromise of 1877, whereby it's the understanding that Republican uh, governments will not deploy U.S. troops in a police capacity, that that didn't end Black political participation, even in Mississippi. In fact, this uh, list of grand jury personnel from Holly Springs in 1881 uh, shows that you know, there are four uh, black Republicans who are still serving as high as the grand jury in the county. They're also greenbackers, sort of white people not aligned with the Democratic Party the way that Featherston would be. And we even see a Wells on the list. Now I've tried my best to, to see if there is any family connection uh, between this Wells and Ida B. Wells, uh, nothing yet, but you see him listed here menacingly by Featherston in his own personal notes um, as a black Republican. Wells, of course, was also active in these years. She's teaching, she's getting her own education. She'll come back to Holly Springs and attend Russ College. Um, she's organizing in community and she's becoming a journalist. In, um, in Memphis, she will create her own uh, newspaper with others, work for a newspaper, The Free Speech, and eventually she'll publish Southern, Southern Horrors in 1892. She's also um, fighting segregation in 1883, famously. She sues the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern Railroad uh, for um, not honoring her fare, her ticket, uh, and for forcibly removing her from the train. She also no doubt knew about stuff going on in Mississippi still. In 1889, uh, the Colored Farmers Alliance movement, uh, some black populists, black agrarians who had fought to create 
their own political party who had uh, created merchants uh, that they, uh, places of business that they wanted to uh, give money to as farmers. Uh, they were actively suppressed by the militia and local uh, police action in 1889 and what became known as the Lafleur County Massacre. Uh, that's just a little ways from where Wells grew up. And between 1889 and 1918, there were 373 lynchings in Mississippi as this new order is uh, attempted to be um, consolidated. And white Mississippians really saw 1890s Constitutional Convention, this rewriting of their founding uh, document as a chance to uh, answer the race question, uh, finally, they would have said. Famously, the president of the um, of the convention says, you know, what are we here for if not to guarantee white supremacy? Um, it is their answer, uh, this document, largely to the surviving presence of Black politics even after the armed uh, suppression of the 1870s. It is a legal blueprint for voter disfranchisement, especially that will be adopted across the region. Uh, the literacy test, the poll tax, the idea of felon disfranchisement in many ways emerge um, from this collection of thinkers in 1890. And there too, uh, Featherston is. He is tapped to write the special report uh, on the militia to the Mississippi State Constitution. Historians usually think of this document for its uh, innovations in, in voting suppression, but Featherston, I think, sees that if we're if you're going to build a, a government like this, that you're going to have the force of arms at the ready. That's the only way it will work. And so this is the quote that I started us with. Right. He featured he talks about this great disparity that he knows will exist in this new system of racial order and that you will have to have a force to put down lawlessness of white and black insurgents, right? There's this idea that uh, there's this very, in keeping with the rest of the constitution that doesn't mention um, the express um, the disfranchisement of black votes, right? This colorblindness that you see in this language too, uh, where it's any sort of disorder is a problem. And that's why we must have a strong state militia, centralized. You know, he, he wants a $10,000 annual appropriation. He wants a thousand troops trained professionally to be on the ready at all times uh, to tamp down this disorder. And this is a man who really has fascinating concepts of disorder in 1877. Uh, he gives a speech that's uh, nearly socialist, certainly populist and anti-monopolist in its order, in its tone. He says, quote, the wealth of the nation is being con concentrated in the hands of the capitalists and corporations. The laboring, toiling masses much, must be oppressed when this is the status of affairs. The millions are drawn from the hard earnings of the masses by unjust legislation and poured into the coffers of the millionaires. He thought then that strikes, secret societies, communists, nihilists, and anarchists were the, quote, legitimate result of this state of affairs. And so he's calling out economic disparity as well, right? He's naming that in this system of disparity, you must have the force of arms to suppress it. And it would be an all white professional militia in his mind. Of course, when Wells talks about the militia, right, she sees a peacekeeping force, um, a force to stop lynching. Um, she was no, certainly no fan of uh, the Mississippi state constitution. She mocked the high state of civilization, which characterizes Mississippi. Um, she hoped instead for a safeguard against extrajudicial mob violence. Um, she even looked at Republican governors like McKinley in Ohio, who had used the militia to stop lynchings there and hoped that a more virtuous executive power in the South 
might do the same thing. She had, of course, uh, the black militia in mind, one that would not be segregated, but would uh, have representation of um, black Southerners in it. That was not the idea of the white ruling class. And you can actually see, I think, Wells's um, uh, thinking on the police and centralized police power and reform change over time. Here she is in the Red Record, published in 1895. Public sentiment by its representatives has encouraged Lynch law and upon the revolution of this sentiment, we must depend for its abolition. The idea that it's going to have to be a war of ideas because this, the virtuous executive does not exist. We must educate our way out of this. And finally, in 1917, writing after the East St. Louis um, white riot, um, quote, all the impartial witnesses agree. The police were either, either indifferent or encouraged the barbarities. No organized effort was made to protect the Negroes or disperse the murdering groups. So here we are in World War I, Wells implicating law enforcement more forcibly still. Now, in conclusion, I just want to pull through another thread to show how the roots of this white supremacist um, uh, militia really do lead to the creation of a state police force, which is alive and well and with us today. To do that, I'm going to look at another county, uh, Copiah County. And one family that comes from there, this man, Thomas Butler Birdsong Jr., born in 1894, born as Featherston is dying, as Featherston is writing this uh, new piece of the state constitution and will in himself lead the state police uh, until 1968. So for 30 years between 1938. He's also in the military scene here in World War II. This man is wild. He, he gets a medal from Chiang Kai-shek in the 1950s. He's really sort of all over the place. Uh, his family, like Featherston's, also has a, a migration into uh, the old Southwest. Um, as I'll show you, he, though, has a very important stopover in South Texas in the borderlands. So here's the birdsong family tree, right? Like Featherston, he has a, a forebear who fought in the Georgia militia as the uh, settler penetration of the Old Southwest began. Uh, his grandfather was a Confederate officer. His father served in the Mississippi militia, no doubt knowing Featherston. And uh, he himself founded the state police force after serving in the militia. He, he, he lied about his age, uh, in fact, to join the militia early at age 16. So the moment that really changes for him, though, is in uh, World War I, where he uh, will go with the Mississippi State Militia, uh, just like militias and National Guard companies all over the country will go to um, secure the borderlands in, in, the, in the words of Woodrow Wilson, to, um, uh, to secure and harden the border. And this is actually a booklet that is created by veterans of this campaign. You know, they call it the invasion of Texas. Um, and that's a major chapter of my, uh, my work now. Right. He, he goes, Birdsong goes and professionalizes. He learns how to work counterinsurgency um, with barbed wire and trenches. These are technologies that, in fact, he will carry back uh, to Mississippi to stop, in many cases, lynching. He will, he will actually secure uh, the execution by the state of Black defendants and, and stop several instances of mob violence before they get going. Um, but as I said, he will come back uh, from World War I first to become uh, a local policeman in Clarksdale, the famous Georgia, uh, I'm sorry, Delta town, and then form uh, the state police in 1938. Uh, but he carries with him a lifetime of connections that he made in Texas. Here he is, and I'm sorry for the haunting negative image here. This is the only form of it I could get on uh, short notice, but here he is with the Texas State Police, and it is in fact under the Texas Rangers uh, 
uh, at the border that he will um, that he will learn that he will professionalize and that he will bring um, back with him to Mississippi to train state policemen in military uh, military uh, work. So that's all I have for you today. Thanks for your kind attention. I really look forward to the Q and A. Great. Uh, thanks so much. That was really fantastic, Justin. This is just a reminder that um, folks should really uh, ask their questions in the... Oh, great. And we have a question coming up. But um, maybe before we get to Marcella's question, um, I just thought I'd open this up for, for discussion and conversation. One of the, you know, really kind of like fascinating terms that you're looking at and like formations that you're looking at are black militias, right? And white militias simultaneously. And I was curious about, um, and maybe this is a, a dense question in some ways, but I was really curious about the differences between black and white militias uh, in the context of a, you know, white supremacist settler democracy. And if you might be able to, uh, you know, just kind of talk uh, with us and talk further uh, about your perspective on what some of those differences might be in terms of, you know, black armed self-defense is organized by, and collective armed self-defense is organized by um, Wells versus, you know, uh, kind of like militias that really are enforcing white supremacist racial terror. And just if the sources say uh, anything further. Yeah, I really wish uh, Wells had gone at length about her idea of, of the militia. She doesn't mention it much, but I do think, you know, you can sort of track uh, if absence tells us anything, right? She doesn't seem to talk about it nearly as much. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a fascinating question and it certainly won't, this sort of um, collective black self-defense will not stop with, um, with the 1890s sort of consolidation at the state level. Uh, it will happen um, sporadically, right? As um, I sort of uh, uh, mentioned in LaFleur County, right? It, it, will, it will happen sporadically across, um, across the state. In 1906, um, there's a famous instance um, where, uh, where men will entrench and sort of surround the, the siege of town because uh, there is uh, sort of waves of white lawlessness and raiding going on into, um, into the black countryside. And, and they will threaten to burn the town or so the white townspeople will say. And so they will sort of send off for the all white militia uh, to come and, and suppress what they uh, will see as a revolt. Obviously, I, I'm mentioning in my sort of hesitation here that this, the source record is, is, is tough. Um, you know, obviously, often you have journalistic records that, that sort of show what's going on and only through uh, scarce sources that make it through into the black press do you get you know, some sort of trustworthy um, impression of what uh, folks thought they were doing or what, what they actually did, uh, who, who stoked the violence in the first place, uh, who, who is sort of the, the instigator. Um, but certainly, you know, during Reconstruction, it is, um, it is a major bone of contention uh, between white uh, Democrat and Black Republican politics. Um, the, the, the Republican Party is providing uh, weaponry and, and training in some extent. And, and I will say that Black militias is, is often, is a bit of a misnomer uh, because it is, it's, it's a biracial militia, we would say. It, it is it's conducted, um, it, it's composed of white and Black um, Republicans often that are, you know, this is an outgrowth of their, um, of their political power in local places. And I think that, um, uh, the, the gentleman that I, I spoke of in Holly Springs had it right. Like they saw it as sort of the counterforce to the Klan, but eventually the, the trump card would be this organized, um, you know, white military unit that would come in um, in times of crisis. Totally. Next we have, uh, thanks, that's, that's really helpful. Um, next we have a question from Marcelo, who is actually a postdoctoral fellow here at CSSJ. So Marcelo writes, first, I would like to thank you, Justin, for your talk. Um, you presented a long durée history of rural policing in Mississippi, connecting slave patrols, state militias, and modern police forces. 
There are other works that address per, uh, partially your topic, such as uh, Celia Haddon's Slave Patrols, which analyzes slave patrols in Virginia and the Carolinas. Only her final pages suggest the connection between slave patrols and modern policing in the American South. Your weak work seems to move further by actually describing the historical process that connects these experiences. How do you think your research moves beyond uh, from Haddon's work and current historiography on the legacies of slavery and policing in America? And how uh, do you manage to interpret the blurry line that separated or perhaps didn't separate state policing and paramilitary policing in Mississippi? Um, so it's a, <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, and I'll, there's a second question too, but maybe we can, can address that one first. <laughs> sure, yeah, Marcella, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, you know, I really, I, I certainly am uh, beholden to Haddon's work here um, and appreciate the way that the slave patrol narrative has sort of um, infiltrated our sort of current way of thinking about policing. Um, you know, it's, it's many a Twitter war, many a Twitter battle has been, is being fought now about, you know, whether this is um, the Peel model coming from the UK or whether this is, you um, you know, the slave patrol suited up. Um, and, you know, I, I really try to do it um, through, um, through, I mean, the, the, the way, the, the institution of the militia is the way that I try to draw this connection because it is, it is, it is understood in its sort of reason for being um, that it will be doing this type of work. Um, certainly, uh, local police forces are going to be doing it too, right? They, they are going to adopt in reconstruction um, this, um, this racially disparate form of policing. And Mississippi has been studied immensely for this. You have something like the pig law, right? These laws that are passed to uh, the vagrancy laws that are passed to ensnare um, uh, freed people and put them, you know, more directly into the hands of, um, uh, at this time, the convict lease, which I will note, importantly, on, on the line of reform coming out of this 1890 constitution, right? At the same time, they're disfranchising Black voters. They are also ridding themselves of the convict lease and imagining the penitentiary. Um, so the idea that you know, forward thinking, uh, progressive uh, government in the state will um, centralize this power and move away from you know, a quote that I didn't read is, um, you know, there was this idea that the sheriff and the medieval posse was sort of ruling, uh, but that instead this could be um, centralized and um, and that centralization, right, is, is what I see as sort of moving through time. The idea that you would have a standing army, uh, much as you did uh, during um, slavery, to suppress any sort of um, conflict that you deemed outside of the norm. Um, you know, I, I really think that that, that carries forward um, just through the mere institutions and the, and the personalities and the families involved. I mean, it really, it has shocked me every time I find that someone who ascends to a, a position of leadership is in a, you know, a multi-generational sort of family um, of militia fighters, right? Um, so I hope that, hope that sheds some light. Uh, it's, I don't think it'll, it'll ever go, um, you know, the, the slave patrol sort of direct line of descent from the slave patrol is important. I think it needs to be balanced with the ethnic cleansing sort of um, settler colonial role of the militia, as well as um, the imperial role, as you know, you see the birdsong family going and sort of policing in the borderlands. Thanks. And then uh, Marcelo also mm -hmm. asked a, a follow up question, which was, you know, um, you know, your research seems uh, it connects rural policing since the late 19th century and contemporary mass incarceration. Um, how does your your book and your scholarship address other forms of imprisonment or, or does it, I guess? 
Yeah, I mean, this is so, this is the, if I could do it all, right, I, I would always have um, placing side by side. I mean, it's the way I, I try to do it is to show the mindset of the people along the way. And they are, you know, as I mentioned with the 1890 Constitution, they are always thinking of the police and the prison side by side, like they see them in tandem. Um and so when there are changing, uh, I guess you could say, imperatives for policing, right, you will see that acted out with the penitentiary. So I mentioned in Mississippi, there was only one state penitentiary from 1906 to 1972 or maybe 76. So, right, the change from like one um, one big penitentiary that is a state-owned farm uh, to, uh, you know, a, a system where it is not actually expected that um, labor is going to be exploited or extracted, but that it is a place for uh, moving um, sort of, uh, to use Ruth Wilson Gilmore's work, right, to, to remove surplus populations and to get them into, um, into other places, um, to get them off the land, especially, uh, is the thing that I really try. Um, to track. That's, that's really terrific to, to hear. Um, I guess it's sort of, I, it looks like maybe we just have time for, for one more question really, but I, I, and I'll, as the moderator, I will take the floor to ask this question, which is just be, I think it'd be really helpful and wonderful to hear sort of like how you, um, you know, what sort of exigencies brought you to this project and how you, how you came to it. Um, yeah, I, so this this project started sitting on the porches of Black landowners conducting oral histories um, and trying to track, uh, you know, families' experiences of survival uh, with, you know, instances where life got really hard, right, and how they either almost just lost their land or did lose, you know, a third or half of their land. And at every turn, right, that, that there seemed to be police. And right, this was in 2012 uh, that I was conducting these interviews. Um, now there seemed to only be one or two pieces removed, um, police officers uh, of one form or another. And, you know, especially getting a sense, hearing another story from the urban policing paradigm was what drove me because people were talking about something like the, the, the livestock investigator or something like that. And I'm like, well, what, what on earth is that? Like when or why do these uh, institutions exist? And that sent me down a much sort of more fundamental uh, rabbit hole <laughs> to, to find out just how they got there in the first place. And once I did that, right, I started seeing pictures from the movement where the, it's, it is not like always just the tobacco chomping um, pot bellied cop. It is, you know, these guys in steel helmets with uh, World War II surplus machine guns. And that really sent me back to you know, seek the root um, of that because it had such an impact in the daily, the sort of the day-to-day -day existence and generational existence uh, of the people who I, who I met uh, near where I grew up in, in the rural South. And you know, that was my, my number one question is, was why had life been so hard for them? And why had it been so difficult uh, for them to have just as, as much as they had? Uh, and why had sort of the good times been punctuated so frequently uh, with this state violence? And um, yeah, that's what, that's what sent me off. And, you know, it's, it's, gone, it's grown since then, um, but that, that's what I'm trying to find out. Um, and how, how does, you know, how, how does a, an idea of reform sort of drive this? at every step, the idea that we're actually doing better. We're, we're, we're doing better by adding more police officers. We're doing better by giving them uh, more military grade training and weapons. That's, yeah, that's just really, really 
um, helpful to hear as well. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're right at time. This is really a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I think everyone looks forward to sort of um, watching your work as it moves forward and no doubt, you know, eventually getting the, getting the book as well. So thanks so much uh, to you, Justin, for joining us and, and thanks uh, everyone else as well. Thanks again, this was great.